Through his unparalleled combination of photographic and promotional skills, William Notman was the first Canadian photographer to build an international reputation. Much of his success lay in creating art that both romanticized and idealized his emerging nation in the years around Confederation. Born and raised in Scotland, young William Notman joined his family's uh, textile manufacturing business, a plan that didn't really last. Faced with an economic downturn in the 1850s, Notman created fraudulent orders to stave off creditors. His ill-conceived plan failed, charges were laid, and Notman fled to Canada in 1856 as a fugitive. Um, not the most auspicious start, fair enough, but um, with significant help from the prosperous Scottish community in Montreal, he quickly built up a new life. He worked first at a dry goods um, import business and then turned to photography in the winter when the ports were shuttered. There's no record of how Notman learned photography, um, but Glasgow, uh, where he came from uh, in his last stop, uh, was an early hub of photography. And by 1859, Notman's business as a photographer was flourishing, and he'd brought his whole family to Montreal, including his parents and brothers, as well as his wife and baby. This is an early portrait of all of them. By the early 1860s, Notman established himself as the premier photographer in Montreal, setting up progressively larger and more elegant studios, expanding with partners to Halifax, Ottawa, St. John, Toronto, as you can see here, as well as the eastern seaboard of the U.S., including Boston. Um, Notman photographed industrial projects, landscape scenes, and made portraits of famous public figures from across Canada and around the world. Um, was Notman's art Canadian? Unquestionably, and not accidentally. His effort to capture the Canadian landscape and culture was deliberate and strategic. Notman sought a coveted commission to photograph um, the building of the Victoria Bridge, an engineering feat that was completed in 1859 and opened up year-round trade between Montreal and the US. Although the images had been made for the railway, Notman also added them to the bank of landscape and urban images he sold to tourists and visiting British military who were then plentiful in Quebec. In other words, his images were both documenting and marketing Canada. Missing no opportunity to promote both Canada and his own work, Notman sent his photographs to fairs and journals around the world. He even created elaborate albums of his work, which he sent to Queen Victoria. And although the little film said that she said he could be um, photographer to the Queen, and that was the story he told people, there's no exact record of that. But he certainly just claimed it and ran with it. And other than whispers, nobody really called him on it. Um, by the early 1860s, only a few years after his very fraught arrival in Montreal, he'd achieved an impressive level of renown, and he was among those working most actively to create a vision of a nation that would soon coalesce into a country called Canada. His efforts paid off, and getting one's picture at Notman's studio became de rigueur during a Canadian tour. Most popular were images that Notman made inside his Montreal studio, where he simulated winter scenes with lamb's wool and salt. This image from his caribou hunting series, commissioned in 1866, features British military officer William Rhodes and his son playing out scenes of adventure in the Canadian wilderness. The chance shot, this image, is carefully lit. It's composed with a snowshoe cast aside, caribou carcass in the foreground, Notman's assistant as the hunting guide, oddly kind of cowering behind roads, very manly. Um, around the campfire from the same series employs a magnesium flare to simulate the campfire, a technical innovation that brought Notman further acclaim in the international um, photographic circles. These winter scenes often reference traditional indigenous ways of life, including hunting and trapping. Although Notman did, did actually make portraits of several um, prominent indigenous <clears throat> figures and groups, his reenactments did not usually include indigenous actors. Instead, he often encouraged sitters in genre scenes like these to play at indigeneity in ways that we now understand to be both familiar and a highly offensive part of Canadian colonial history. 
Like the Victoria Bridge photographs, the Caribou Hunting series did double duty. They were both quirky portraits of Captain Rhodes, which apparently he very proudly kept and showed people, and they also served as genre pictures to enter that bank of things that Notman kept and sold to, they were sold to tourists and locals, perfectly timed with Confederation. Not all of Notman's um, studio winter scenes were so rugged, and his winter studio also lent itself to more elegant vignettes of winter life in the New World, such as this image of children in fancy dress on skates. What appears as a skating pond in this image was actually a surface of a polished zinc sheet laid out on the floor of his studio. Because cameras were not yet speedy enough to take snapshots of crowds, composite photographs were used to document large events, like the skating party uh, Victoria Rink, <clears throat> 1870. Composites were created by cutting and pasting individual prints onto a large-scale image and then re-photographing that whole, which is how this image was created. For inclusion in one of those large composites, participants would be invited to visit the studio in their costumes. Once the print was created from this portrait sitting, Notman's production staff would literally cut with scissors, cut out the figures, and then lay them in the larger image. Never to miss an opportunity, Notman sold the vignettes, like this, in addition to the larger collage. And in this case, four affluent white children playing imperial dress up, and it is a pretty bizarre collection, um, and that the, um, the hand that seems to be coming out of her head, it's in every one of the sitting shots. I don't know, I mean, it's literally like, I think kids just behaving badly and Notman could not get control of them. <clears throat> Um, four affluent white children playing imperial dress up in a lovely winter playground at the moment of confederation certainly does capture a certain kind of settler colonial life in Montreal. However, aspects of this vignette that are not immediately visible point to the complexity of Notman's work and his role as a Canadian artist. The father of these children was John Lovell, a wealthy Montreal publisher whose bustling mansion was often home to long-term guests. In 1865, the Lovell family hosted the children of their friend Jefferson Davis, deposed president of the American Confederacy. Although this may surprise us now, Confederates had strong ties in Montreal. Prior to the Civil War, the South had relied on the North for financial resources, and during the war, they turned to the financial hub of Montreal. The Confederates also found political support in both Canada and in Britain. And many prominent American Southerners sat for Notman during their visits north. In the spring of 1867, the Lovells finally welcomed Davis himself. Newly released from prison and awaiting charges of treason, <clears throat> he was, one of his first stops in Montreal was Notman's studio. Recast by Notman um, from a dangerous failed rebel uh, to a devoted family man, Jefferson stands behind his studious wife gazing off camera. The result is an image that puts the elegant banality of Notman's Victorian studio to work in re-envisioning a man who played a leading role in one of the ugliest chapters in American history. This is not the story we usually tell of Canadian history <clears throat> in relation to American slavery and the Civil War. But if we're going to celebrate the role of Canada and Canadians in the Underground Railroad, it seems crucial that we also reckon with the role that Canada, as well as its artists, played in supporting less venerable causes. Today, the archive of Notman's Montreal studio, one of the few remaining complete archives of any 19th century photographic studio in the world, holds almost half a million images. It is no exaggeration to suggest that Notman's view of 19th century Canada has in many ways shaped our collective understanding of this period. It's also a place that merits considerably more study to understand both the complex and yet to be told story of what makes William Notman's art Canadian. Thank you.